Chapter 47, The Brain Drain. We have all heard the expression brain drain, and I always thought I understood it as a social, economic, and political concept. Simply stated, the smart ones always leave and the dumb ones always stay behind to run things. That's a wrong impression. It is not even close. It's worse than that. If you do not see the brain dream happen, you feel it happen later and it takes a long time for the brain drain to settle in. And when it does, it is pervasive. The rot of pervasive ignorance adopted by those who are slowly left behind becomes the norm for everybody. And then by default, with the constant of facing no opposition, it becomes the standard. Everyone lies about everything. Lying to please becomes the accepted answer for everything. Lying over and over until lying is acceptable behavior by the entire non-alert, ostrich-like community as evidenced by the ritualistic repetition, rep repetition of their own silly myths. Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, the Truth Fairy, the Tooth Fairy, and most of all, the religious stories that are bouncing about, blamed on some kind of tradition. That's a roundabout way of saying they teach their young all their own bullshit. And remember, in these non-alert, ostrich-like communities, it's always the other guy's fault because they did this to us. And they ain't as courteous or very courteous about believing our bullshit. Throughout the history of the entire human race, during seasonal migrations, men left home to find food or work. If they got it, they asked their families to follow. Ergo, building villages, building towns, and then finally building cities. Population centers all over the world got to be very crowded this way, and Namibia was no exception. All human survival is about work for food and shelter. Where there are no jobs, there are no people. Those left behind in depressed areas die a slow death from the reverse of growth called depression. The young sense it first. Mom, I want to go away to school. This place sucks. There is nothing for me to do around here. That's what you hear. Well, not too far now, sweetie. We want to see your pretty face once in a while. The third world parents know for certain no way you're going because we'll never see you again. <clears throat> well, that's Swakopmund in a nutshell. I watch my friends in Namibia suffer from this destructive brain drain, malady, brain drain malady with no jobs, no schools from which to get jobs, no jobs for the well-educated, and no training for the undereducated. No boyfriends for the uh, girls, no girlfriends for the boys, no future for anyone, especially nothing left for the kids. Yet everyone in the town was pretending it was the most exciting day of their life and their preferred existence. Sound familiar? Did you ever read Facebook? This brain drain reality hits all social and political institutions all over the world, not just Africa. City and farm area school districts die. Political parties die. Corporations and family businesses die. Religious and social movements die and even entire countries and civilizations die. What this town needs is an opportunity for computer education after high school, said I to my buddy Andrew and my senpai, Dr. Wonderful, over coffee. Knowing his own two young adult sons were in the same brain drain, frame of mind, and targeting Australia as their escape plan. Woten got it. It was already too late for his family planning goals, but he was sympathetic to the entire Namibian community and therefore agreed to help me put it together and serve on our board of directors. I approached him first to start the cyber university in Africa for two locals we both knew personally. They were mercilessly caught in the squeeze of the brain drain in Swakopmund. One. Sure, Swakopmund Wonders could go to the University of Namibia in Vindhoek, 350 kilometers away, but there are still no jobs in Namibia to absorb university graduates. So, I had the bizarre idea to help them stay in Swakopmund and many more like them. I would try to launch a new computer education project in English. Woten accepted. 
My next visit was to the governor's office, Asa Kapari. He agreed, and the rest was up, uphill to, to finally getting a borrowed computer. That is exactly how it started. Then Andrew brought in his girlfriend, Yanita, pronounced Yanita. She had a job in a beachfront tourist hotel office because she could speak English, Afrikaans, German, and some Ovambo. But most importantly, she could type. She was also interested in furthering her own education. Okay, I think we're getting there. That was our very beginning. Now I had the makings of a board of directors and two brand new willing college students. And not one other damn thing. Hell, I was lucky to be eating after I paid my rent. There was a computer software firm of sorts in town. <clears throat> Andrew and I visited unannounced one day, and they politely spoke English to me, and then Afrikaans to each other. Most of them in Swakopmund do that. It always irritated the crap out of me, and that's why I always took Andrew to meetings. They thought he was American, so he would tell me later about all their hidden agendas and what they spoke behind my back. I talked to their boss about training locals to use a computer. He also got it. He encouraged a beautiful young Afrikaner lady to volunteer on behalf of his company to help us unhook her own personal computer and set it up each weekend in my new flat near downtown Swakopmund, which I planned to use as our new classroom. <coughs> on Saturday mornings, our Afrikaans lady taught our first cyber university class of 22 Namibians that spoke very, very little English and she compensated for that small disability by requiring them to explain what they were doing in English. Andrew and I, screaming constantly, if you don't speak English, you can't help us. And everybody wanted to help set up the computer. So they tried, and eventually they got it. It took many months, but we did it. We accomplished exactly the goal we set without telling them. They practiced typing in English constantly, and all passed a professional, internet-based typing test in English and could send an email to, in any language as well. They could search for women's fashions, motorcycles, and all kinds of crazy stuff I gave them for assignments. Both Andrew and Yanita learned to type in English by ear as I dictated. We wrote all the courses together and put together all the printed materials for all the classes in five subjects. They were terrific students and became my first teachers as well by the end of the first half of the year. We had a great time putting it all together, and here's how we did it. And the next is chapter 48.